used to run tennis camps for 10 to 14 year olds, 7 to 9 year olds, and 5 to 6 year olds. But our fastest growing camps were for 3 to 4 year olds. Well-meaning parents would drive their preschoolers to the courts, then peel their kids off their legs to get them to actually go out on the court. Sometimes really ambitious parents would even try and sneak their two-year-olds into the class so they could play up a level. And although we had a policy stating that all participants had to be potty trained, we occasionally had some workplace disasters. While playing a game called Popcorn Popper, which involves kids squatting down at the net and then popping up to hit a volley, one little boy got a little too excited and didn't pop up. Instead, he peed on his racket, which we immediately threw in the nearest garbage can and never spoke again, except for every time I've told this story. Don't get me wrong. These camps were as developmentally appropriate for three to four year olds as hour long sports camps possibly could be both in terms of the activities and the equipment that was used to teach motor skills to preschool age kids. In fact, the creator of the camps was inducted into the International Tennis Hall of Fame for her contributions to tennis education. But it often struck me that the opportunity cost for participating in camps just might not be worth it for parents and their kids. What is an opportunity cost? Well, it means the real cost of buying something or doing something is what you have to give up for the purchase or to participate. If a teenager with limited money buys an iPhone, that might mean that they can't afford designer jeans and a new set of tires for their used car. So in some sense, the cost of the iPhone is $650 plus tax, but in another sense, the cost of the phone is a pair of designer jeans and road safety. For tennis camps, the opportunity costs were other things that the children and parents could be doing with their time, like spending their time together. These tennis camps were run in Redmond, Washington, where Microsoft is based, and Kirkland, Washington, where Costco Wholesale started. So it's a fairly affluent community with busy adults and overscheduled children. While collecting data for my dissertation, I asked some of the four-year-olds about organized sport versus free play, in kid-friendly terms, of course. And I remember one little girl who said, oh, I would much rather play with my dad. He's like a champion at tennis, but he almost never has time to play with me. Her mother, who was sitting nearby, looked at me and said, Noted. So I tried to talk with some of the parents and see why they had chosen to sign their preschoolers up for camp. In addition to the vague, everyone else is doing it sort of sentiment, what I found, especially among the moms, was a lack of confidence in their ability to teach motor skills to their own kids. Now, there are certainly some benefits of early participation in organized camps, especially in terms of development of social skills and self-regulation. But I think that there are also some tremendous benefits for the parent-child relationship when parents and children play together. So I decided to figure out how to help parents learn to confidently play with their kids in a way that would promote motor skill growth and increase the amount of quality time that parents and kids spent together. And so I examined the games that worked well at each age level and thought about the processes that I used to create new games during camps. And I realized that the secret sauce, if you will, could be summarized in four parts. They have a task, an objective, they use some tools or toys, and they have a theme. And that's why I call them top games. So to give you an idea how simple these games can be, take a look at this example. I'm here with my nephew Ryland who just turned five and my niece Ellie who just turned four and we're gonna play a little game called Critters. How's that sound? Good. All right. Okay. Ryland, what is this? It's a tennis ball, but we're going to pretend it's a mouse that goes like this. 
Okay, Ellie, what is this? Yeah, it looks like a tennis ball, but we're gonna pretend it's a frog that goes like this. Now, the object of our game is we need to catch all of the critters before they escape. All right, so let's stand up. Ryland, are you ready to catch one mouse before it escapes past the fence? Okay, ready, set, go! Okay, ready, Ellie? Go get the mouse! We're gonna try and catch two mice and one frog. Ready? Okay, Ellie, are you ready to catch two mice before they escape up the fence? Okay, ready, set, go! Okay. okay. Ryland, we're gonna try and catch two mice and two frogs. Okay, Ryland, are you ready to catch two mice and three frogs? Okay, Ellie, are you ready to catch four frogs? So that's an example of a top game. A game that includes a task and objective, makes use of some tools or toys, and has a theme. In Critters, the kids try to collect all of the mice and frogs before they escape. The tasks include running, eye tracking, and grasping. The objective was to collect all of the tennis balls before or after they stop rolling. The toys and tools were the tennis balls. And Critters is obviously based on an animal theme. Critters is one of literally millions of games that could be created using the TOT formula. One key to creating fun TOT games is to make sure the tasks are developmentally appropriate. For some age levels, TOT games might emphasize tasks like throwing, kicking, jumping, or balancing. Another key is to have an age-appropriate objective. In Critters, the objective was to collect all of the critters. Did you notice that Ryland and Ellie were really focused, but showed glimpses of pride as they picked up each tennis ball, even if the ball had stopped rolling? In Critters, it's just a matter of time until they've completed the task, and this is one reason why Critters is so popular among preschool age kids in our tennis camps. Other taught games might use different objectives. Some games might be imitative, as in, can you do what I'm doing? Or proximic, as in, how close to the target can you get? Or cumulative, as in, how many times can you do this? Or timed, as in, how fast can you do this? Or how many times can you do this in two minutes? For older kids, some games might use a ratio to keep score, as in, how many times out of 10 can you do this? Especially with younger children, it is often very helpful to be creative with the tools or toys that you choose to use. Critters is actually an exception to the normal rule that using pressurized tennis balls on a tennis court with preschool or kindergarten age children is not the best idea. 
The reason being, tennis balls move pretty fast, and the tracking skills of preschool and kindergarten age kids aren't highly developed yet. So for games involving eye tracking or catching tasks, juggling scarves, foam balls, balloons, or bubbles work really well for preschoolers and kindergartners. Finally, having a theme for each game is crucial. Without a theme, it's not a taught game. Running after rolling or bouncing balls may be fun for a while, but catching critters, trying to escape, is way more fun. In my experience, adding a developmentally appropriate theme to a game or drill triples the attention span of the participants. The possible themes are virtually unlimited. In the tennis camps, we use culinary themes like seven-layer dip, education themes like principal's office, and we would sometimes tap into pop culture. One summer, Shrek was really big, and so we played a volley game called Shrek Swamp. If I had run tennis camps this past summer, I suspect we would have incorporated Frozen into at least one of the games that we played. Narratives capture attention. Preschool age children aren't particularly good at listening to instructions for more than a few seconds, but they can focus on a story for a much longer period of time. Likewise, a good theme taps into the imaginations of younger children, allowing them to play a role in the story. And when they are playing a role in the story, their attention span increases dramatically, thereby allowing them to get more reps, if you will, in the motor skill involved in the game. But trying to get preschoolers to engage in structured games for 60 minutes may not be the most developmentally appropriate approach. The thing about organized sport activities is that parents understandably want to feel like they're getting something for their money. So there is a fundamental tension between what is most developmentally appropriate and what is most marketable. And that is one reason why some parents may consider playing taught games with their kids rather than outsourcing motor skill development to professionals. When you're at home, you don't need to fill an hour. Sometimes preschoolers might be interested for two minutes or sometimes they might be interested for 20 minutes. To emphasize the simplicity of the most popular games for preschoolers, consider a game called Seasons. Seasons works by saying winter, spring, summer, fall, and then throwing up leaves, i.e. juggling scarves, and having children try to catch them as they fall to the ground. And if parents don't have juggling scarves, Kleenex are a pretty good alternative. Though the tot name suggests that these games are for toddlers, which they are, the tot formula also works for games that are more appropriate for older kids. My legacy in the Seattle tennis community is a game called Dynasty. Now to give you some background, I often worked with particularly precocious kids. I once taught tennis lessons to a 13-year-old who had already gotten a higher score on the SAT than I had my senior year of high school, which wasn't saying much, but that's another story. So my point being, I worked with the smart kids. So incorporating historical themes into our games worked for these particular kids who were a little bit nerdy and very likely to create code and medical advances that will change the world someday. One day we were playing a game that was based on Foursquare. And after one of the kids had stayed in the champion spot for a long period of time, one of the other kids remarked that he had built a dynasty. And this triggered an idea. So the kids and I embellished the game by incorporating dynasty era Chinese history. Dynasty works like this. There is an emperor who stands here, and a magistrate to his or her left. They both live in the palace. On the other side are the peasants who live on the countryside. 
The peasants are always trying to rise up and defeat the emperor. Each time a point is played, the emperor either loses the point or someone else loses the point. If the magistrate or peasant loses the point, they go to the end of the line and everyone moves up a spot. But if the emperor loses two points in a row, he or she leaves power in a natural takeover. While the emperor is in power, the emperor receives 10 years on his or her reign for every point someone else loses. And the ultimate goal of the game is to end the day with the longest dynasty. But if one of the peasants hits a winner, i.e. hits a ball by the emperor or in front of the emperor and the emperor is not able to touch the ball, that peasant completes a hostile takeover and starts with all of the years the previous emperor had when he or she was thrown out of power. So the Adam dynasty might be replaced by the Lacey dynasty. Now, as you can imagine, there was some strategy involved. Some of the emperors would choose to leave power voluntarily in order to keep the decades that they had accumulated during their long run but others would let it ride, searching for more years on their dynasty. The game may sound a little nerdy, and it was, but it was wildly popular. Now, having played a very similar four-square game for a few years before Dynasty was created, I am confident that it was the narrative that transformed something that was just another tennis game into something that was almost addictive to teenagers. A couple years later, when I started supervising the multi-site tennis camps across Redmond and Kirkland, Washington, we actually had to put restrictions on the amount of time that instructors were allowed to let their 10 to 14 year olds play Dynasty to make sure they practiced all of the strokes in tennis throughout the week. The taught formula is one way to teach motor skills using a games approach. So whether you work with other people's kids or your own progeny, you might give it a try. But don't overthink it. As long as you have a task, an objective, make use of some tools and toys, and have a theme, you've got a top game. The top formula works well for preschoolers, tweens, and everywhere in between. If you're still not convinced, listen to our paid-in ice cream non-attorney spokesman.